Now, I don't know how many of you have had dental work done in the last year. Anybody? Yeah, dental work? Anyone? Yeah? I'm coming to check your dental work. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, dental work, we have had our go with that, um, good and bad. Deborah had an experience in Dallas with a doctor called Hibernia Dental Arts. It was in Uptown Dallas. We lived uptown. We lived in Uptown, and we worked for an apartment complex, and it was a Christian organization. We Basically, our goal was to get people to come to church, so we would be at this apartment complex in Uptown, something that we could not afford in newlyweds, but we worked for the apartment complex, and we found a little dentist right next door in this Uptown area, boutique. I don't know what they paid in rent. It's probably a lot, but we thought, oh, this is great. So Deborah goes in there, and she had some, some uh, a tooth chip, and she had to go to this place. We came back from our trip. She went in. They took a uh, mold for her and said, you don't need a crown. Okay. They said, you could pay half of your money up front, or you could pay for it all. She said, well, I'll just pay half. So she paid for half of it. And then we waited. They said it'd take a little while, two weeks, three weeks. She calls. Oh, we had a problem with it, you know. It did, it did come in on our last shipment. I don't know why it didn't come in. We see four weeks. Oh, yeah, we got to call and see what's going on. I don't know why that's not Five weeks? Six weeks, and she still doesn't have her crown? We're wondering, what is going on? So we drive over to their dental place, and the door's locked. And they're out of business. <laughs> they're done. They never did order her, her crown. They took her money, and they never gave those services. We said that's a breach of contract, right? And the payment for services rendered that, they ne that she never got. <clears throat> so we just had to chalk that up to experience, and she went to another dentist, and, and we had to just start over with another dentist. But I wonder if you've had something like that where you paid for something, you were supposed to get some service, right? And it never came. And maybe it was an innocent, you know, oversight. Um, maybe it was just something that, you know, was some, out of somebody's, you know, power of doing something. Or maybe it was they had a really bad motives and they knew they weren't going to be able to deliver, but they took your money anyway. And then they disappeared. You know, the story after story, you could go through and find people getting ripped off, right? You get online and, and start looking in. I got ripped off, you know, hear stories. People love to tell stories about that. But the reason, because that happens, we have something called a contract, right? You enter into a contract in most cases with businesses when you're going to do something. Now, dentists, it's actually not so much a contract. You don't sign a contract, but you pay them. And the assumption is, we're going to do what we said we're going to do for you. <clears throat> but what we call contracts in our society in modern day is similar to, a little different, but similar to something in the Bible that we're going to talk about today, which is called a covenant. A covenant. And what we're going to talk about today is God's covenant with Abram. And we talked about this a little bit in Genesis 12 because that's really where this started. God's covenant with Abram. And we talked a little bit about it last time. We were, in, we were in two weeks ago. We did Genesis 15. We did the first sec, six verses. And we talked about how Jesus um, offers us salvation by grace through faith. Right? By grace we're saved through faith. And that it was the same thing that saved and brought about righteousness in Abram. He believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Then last week we looked back at, well, why do we need to be saved? We looked back at sin. We jumped back all the way to John 4, uh, or forward, I guess, from Genesis, to John 4 to look at what is our greatest problem. Our greatest problem is sin. And Jesus took care of that on the cross. So we're back in Genesis 15 today. And in Genesis 15, 7 through 21, what I want you to be focused on is this covenant that God makes with Abraham who is still now Abram. He's, he's still called Abram. So turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis 15. <clears throat> We're going to be talking about a covenant. First, let's talk for a minute. What is the word covenant? What does that mean? It happens in the English Bible, the translation that you probably have, about 325 times in the Bible this word comes up, covenant. That's not insignificant, 325 times. The first eight times are about Noah. 
God talks to Noah and he says, I'm going to make a covenant with you. Not only with you, I'm going to make a covenant with all people living. What does he say he won't do again? I will not destroy the earth with a flood like I did in this occasion with the flood. And he tells him eight times. He uses the word covenant. I'm making a covenant with you. He gives them a sign of the covenant. Kids, what's the sign of the covenant of Noah? Rainbow. The rainbow. That's his sign of its uh, covenant with Noah and with all of humanity, saying, I will not destroy the world by, by flood again. And he, and he made that sign for his covenant. The next occurrence, after we get through Noah, is in our passage today. Chapter 15, verse 18. So I think you're ready for it. As we come into this, um, the we're question we're answering is, how does God make a covenant? We're going to look at how he makes a covenant with Abram, and by extension, how does God make a covenant with us? If you would stand as we read God's word, and, and as again, I, I say this every week, but this is not <clears throat> some book. This is the book. This is God's word. It's God's inspired word, and as such, we give it respect and stand as we read it. <clears throat> so read with me silently as I read aloud. Genesis 15, 7. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. But Abram said, O sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? So the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abram brought all these to him, <clears throat> cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. Then the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Adam, Abram drove them away. And the sun was setting. Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own. They will be enslaved and mistreated for 400 years, but I will punish the nation they serve as slaves. Afterward, they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your fathers in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. When the sun had set and the darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, To your descendants I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river of the Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, Kenizzites, Cadmonites, Hittites, Perizzites, Raphitites, Amorites, Canaanites, Girgashites, and Jebusites. The word of the Lord. Please be seated. <clears throat> Again, if you're looking for names for kids, there are some good options here at the end. you got some really good names there, Karin. Uh, so just be thinking about that, Jacob. That it's an option there. Uh, Cadmonite, Cadman, you know, or um, Raphaite. So um, let's talk about a, a, a covenant. What is a covenant? Uh, BDB is one of the, the tools that we use in seminary. It's a lexicon. It takes Hebrew words and gives you all the meanings in all the different areas and ways. And BDB is one of the famous ones. It's, it's from Brown, Driver, and Briggs. They say that a covenant is a defined constitution or ordinance with signs or pledges. So divine from God, constitution, so this kind of agreement or ordinance with signs or pledges. Ligon Duncan, who's a pastor in the PCA, says this. He says, a covenant is a God-initiated, binding, living relationship with blessings and obligations. A, a God-initiated, binding, living relationship with blessings and obligations. Now, both of these have the term divine or God-instituted. It's something that God does with us. It's, a, a, it's an agreement of sorts. It's a constitution, or it's a binding relationship and it's living. It's, it's not just for, for later when we die. It, it's for right now. 
It's something that God does with us, and it involves blessings, and it involves obligations. Well, how does God make a covenant? Let's look back here and remember Genesis 12. What did God say to Abram in Genesis 12? Well, if you want to flip back there with me, it's worth reviewing the first three verses of Genesis 12. <clears throat> The Lord said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household. Go to the land I will show you. Remember, he didn't give a map and say, here's exactly what's going to happen. He just said, go. Do you have faith to follow me, to trust me when I say go? And Abram said, yes, I will go. And he said, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. And you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And who curses you, I'll curse you. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So here you have more of his descendants. He's saying, I'm going to give you, I'm going to make you a great nation. And Abram was thinking, I don't have any children yet. And I'm very, I'm getting on in my years, Lord. But he said, I'm going to make you a great nation. And I'm going to bless you. And from you, there'll be someone from you who will be a blessing to all nations. We know who that is. We talked about that. Who is that? Jesus. Jesus, a blessing to all nations. Then flip over to 1314. God kind of expands this blessing and he says this. The Lord said to Abram after Lot had parted with him, lift up your eyes from where you look, north, south, east, west, all the land you see I give to you and your offspring forever. I'll make your offspring like the dust of the earth. If anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. Go walk through the length, the breadth of the land. I'm giving this to you. So we see two major things that this, this covenant he makes with Abram. One is people, descendants. You're, you're going to have descendants, and your descendants are going to become a great nation, a lot of people. And second thing, the land. You're going to have this land. He gave them this land, and he gave them this, this blessing of a family. And descendants. So these things were, were told to Abram. God told him this land and family. And in your family, all the earth will be blessed through one person. That's through Jesus Christ. Now, what we have here in verse in chapter 15, it's the ratification of God's covenant. The ratification. What do I mean by that? Well, you know, you have a you have a constitution. One of the guys defined this as a constitution. You write up the constitution, you get to people to to, to look it over, but it's not ratified until it's voted upon and it's put in, it's enacted, right? It's started up. And God has already done this. He's already said this is what I'm going to do. But now he's going to go through a ceremony with Abram. And the ceremony is what ratifies, what brings um, a lot of closure and a lot of certainty to what he said to Abram. Look at verse 7, 15, 7, again. I brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans. Remember, we talked about that. That's Persia right now. That's, that's Iraq. The, town, the, the country of Iraq is where <clears throat> he was living, close to the Persian Gulf. And he left there, and he went way up on the high route along the Euphrates, probably, or the Tigris, depending on which road he was on, but around the desert, up to the top to where modern day, almost to modern day Turkey. And then he kept coming down and he came down into the promised land to, to Israel. And this movement, this going, um, he, he said, I brought you out of this land. To, I brought you out of Ur to give you this land that you would possess. The land where he is right now. <clears throat> but he says, look, how am I going to know if I possess it? Yeah, you, this is great. You told me I'm going to have a bunch of descendants. I still don't have kids. You told me you're going to give me this land. How do I know that? I mean, I don't know that. I, I'm here. I'm in the land. But how do I know that? So he tells him, okay, <clears throat> verse 9. Bring me a heifer, a goat, a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. And he brought them, he cut them in half, and he arranged them opposite each other. Well, what is going on here? <clears throat> if I brought in a bunch of animals cut them in half, and laid them out here in two parts. You probably must be getting up, walking out the door, I believe, and finding a new place to worship. <laughs> it's a little weird, right? Well, this was a custom of his day. This was a custom of that time. This is what they did. And they would cut an animal in half, 
Uh, in this area, usually it was a donkey. They would cut a donkey in half, and they would put half the donkey on one side, half on the other. This is gruesome, I know, this is disgusting. But this is what they would do. And what they would do is they would walk between the dead animal. And what they were saying is, if you or I don't hold up our end of the bargain, may we become like this dead animal. May that happen to us. They were, it was serious. That was their word as their bond. They, they cut an animal and walked between that animal. Now, what, these five animals are different. This is not a donkey. Where are these animals coming from? Well, the goat, a ram, a dove, a pigeon, and a heifer. All five of these animals are animals that God is going to institute when he gives Moses the Levitical laws. These are animals that were prescribed for sacrifice for sin. These are the animals that they would bring. Once a year, they bring two goats. The scapegoat would go and the one goat they would kill on the Day of Atonement for their sin. When they were to do a sin offering, they were to bring a pigeon. When they were to sacrifice for a firstborn child, they were to bring uh, a dove, a pigeon. They were, to, they, were to, they were to bring an animal. These animals were the animals that God had prescribed for sacrifice. Some, some theologians get real, I mean, they have, a, they have a whole story for each of these. Here's what a heifer represents. And I, I don't, I'm not going to go there today. I don't think that's the point of this. The point is this. God told him to bring these animals together. It cost him something. He brought these animals. He sacrificed them. He put them on the side. And God was about to do something with this covenant that Abram would have understood. That we walk between these animals that are dead. And we say, if we don't keep our end of the bargain, may we become like this. The birds of prey came in. I had one pastor, as I was doing some research for this, said that the, the carrion bird was like a falcon, and that was the symbol of Egypt. And it was like Egypt persecuting Israel, and Israel, these five animals. Uh, again, it's a great, that's a, you know, it's creative, I think, but that's not the point of this, I think. The point is, God told him to do something, put these animals aside, and then he, he wanted him to preserve this for what he was about to do. God was about to do something. He was about to ratify his covenant. So his son's going down. Well, why are they three years old? That's another question you might have. Everybody think about that. Why, are they, why do they have to be three years old? Well, three years old, they weren't, they weren't immature anymore. They were fully who they were. Like a, the heifer three years old was mature. If it was female, could have could have um, calves, right? A pigeon, all these animals. At three years old, they were mature. They were fully who they would be. But they also were in, they also were in, the best shape probably of their life, right? Three years old. They're young, they're fit, but they're also mature. So these animals were mature. It cost something to Abram and he has them to put these together. So as the sun's going down, a deep sleep falls on Abram and darkness falls upon him. Now, that's not uncommon. When people come into the presence of the Lord for, for a bit of fear and, and a overcome feeling that they're in the presence of the Almighty. You know, when we are truly in the presence of the Lord, our thoughts aren't, oh, hey, God's my bro. Yeah, no. It's, this is the Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, the God who created all things, the God who sustains me. And, and I cut these animals up and I realized but for God, I could be like these animals. He sustains me. He provides for me. And this is God. This is not a friend. This is not some idol. This is the, the God of the universe. And as such, I think he's, he's just overcome with the severity of what's going on. Of, of God, the darkness goes down, sun goes down, deep sleep falls on and darkness falls upon him. The Lord says to Abram, know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in the land. What's he talking about? Where, what's he talking about? The Israelites are going to go where? To Egypt. They're going to be in Egypt. And he says to them, Abram, just broad strokes, 2000 BC. Okay? Think 2000 BC. Broad strokes, when is the Exodus? About 1450 BC, 1446 BC. 
So we're talking 550 years before Moses led them out of bondage. Okay? And he's telling him, your descendants are going to go to a land that's not theirs. They're going to be afflicted for 400 years. But I'm going to bring judgment on the nation they serve. They're going to come out. And, but you will be buried in a good old age. And they'll come back here in the fourth generation. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. <clears throat> kind of good news, bad news here, right? Good news. You're going to live to a ripe old age, is what some versions say. To a good old age. Abram was going to live in peace until he just, his eyes dimmed and he saw heaven and he was slowly transferred from this world to the presence of, of the Lord. He said, but your, your descendants, it's going to be rough for them for about 400 years. That's, that's a little ways. That's a, that's a good bit of time for your descendants. If I told you, hey, you're going to die peacefully but you know your kids and their kids and your kids, for about 400 years, they're going to be slaves. For about 400 years. Not, not such a good, not such a good uh, forecast, right? But then he says, but they're going to come back out. They will come out to this land, and I'm going to bring them back here in the fourth generation. Now, you may, you may be doing the math in your head and going, 400 years, four generations? Wait a minute, doesn't the Bible say elsewhere? 430 years? It does. Moses, who we believe wrote Genesis and Exodus, wrote these both these same things. In Exodus 1240, it says this. The time the people of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. At the end of 430 years on that very day, all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. In Galatians 317, it's repeated. Uh, the law, which came 430 years later, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God, and he's talking about uh, the, the, that's a time period for, for Moses and those in, in there. So what's the deal? Why could it be 400 and some say 430 years? Well, one simple observation is this. What does it say? It says they will be afflicted for 400 years. But how long were they in Egypt? 430 years. I think one option to, to help you kind of work through this, because I'm not going to say God's word contradicts itself. This is God's word. It's true. Is that they were there for 430 years, and after 30 years, they started to be afflicted. They were afflicted for 400 years, but they were there in Egypt for 430 years. And when they started out, life was good, right? Joseph was in charge, and they were in the best land. They put him in Goshen. They didn't have any problems, but eventually... When a pharaoh died and a new pharaoh came about, that's when things started becoming difficult for them. So for 400 years, they were afflicted. So anyway, just something to, to, to point that out. And then generations, back then, I think those are ball, you know, round figures, generations, four generations. But a Abram, he was over 100 years. So for someone to live over 100 years was not uncommon at that time. Then the last part in this passage we want to talk about is the Amorites. It says that the sin of the Amorites was not full. Exactly, he says, uh, the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Now, I'm not going to go into all the sin of the Amorites, but you can go back and read in Leviticus about the sin of those that they're going to dispose from the land. It involves Molech. It involves horrible things with children. Um, it involves... Horrible things with their bodies. And God had been patient. Very patient with the Amorites and the people in this land. And he said, I'm going to give them some more time. We're talking 600 more years. 550 more years from the time of Abram to the time of the Exodus. That he says, when their sin is full, then, there be, then they'll be judged. The question is not... The question is not, how could God do this and, and that they judge this land? It's, how could he wait for 550 more years when all of this sin is going on? God is God. And his judgment is, is true. It's just. And when the Israelites come out, he does judge the sin of the Amorites. 
So then it says, when the sun had gone down and it was dark, in verse 17, a smoking fire pot with blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. Wait a minute. I, I thought that two people walked together. They put the dead animal, and then the two people walked together. But where was Abram? He's back here on the ground in, in kind of darkness, but God's speaking to him. Even in his sleep, he's telling him what's going to happen. Does Abram get up and walk through? No. What walks through? A flaming pot that represents God's holiness. And it, walk, it goes through, passes between. So what does that mean? Did, did the covenant not work? Yes, it does work. But who is the one that's walking through that is going to be on the hook for withholding and upholding the covenant? Only God. God said, I will go through here by myself because I am the one that establishes this covenant with you. I am the one who will make sure that it happens. I am the one that will bring it about. I will. You don't worry about it. I'm going to pass through here. And when God's presence symbolized by this flaming pot that just appears. It's not a pot that he had. It says a flaming pot appears and goes through and then goes and it's gone. Fire. The Lord is fire. He comes through. What, what, did, what did God appear to the Israelites as? In the day? A cloud. And the night? A pillar of fire. When the Holy Spirit descended upon the disciples, what did, what did they see? Tons of fire, flaming of fire. So God, this fire pot, goes between the pieces, and he's saying to Abram, I am the one who's establishing this covenant with you. I am the one who's going to make it work. I am the one that's going to make sure that all of this happens. God knew. He knew exactly what was going to happen when Joseph went down to Egypt. He called the year. He knew exactly when he was going to raise up Moses, what he was going to do, how Moses was going to take these people out. He knew exactly what was going to happen when they came back to the promised land. And it all happened according to his plan, because he's God, because he knows all things, he sees all things, he's all powerful, and he has every ability to bring about his plan. God establishes the covenant. It was sure to happen because he would make sure that it happened. Last, two weeks ago, we talked about a lot from Romans about this passage. And I said this whole, you know, there's a whole chapter in Romans that talks about Abram and how he was justified because he was credited to him. We are justified the same way. The same way that God makes a covenant with Abram is the way that God makes a covenant with us. And God's covenants unfold. The Noahic, the Noah covenant unfolds. And then the Abramat, Abrahamic covenant, that's what this is unfolds. And then later we'll get to the Davidic covenant, the covenant he has with David that expands more, that he'll give a ruler that will rule forever. And that's Jesus, a descendant of, of David, will rule forever. And then we have the new covenant. Oh, the new covenant that every week we, we mention when we take communion. What did Jesus say? This is my blood of the new covenant shed for the forgiveness of your sins. And this concept of a new covenant is in Jeremiah 31, 31. It's also repeated in Hebrews 8, 8. So if you only have a New Testament Bible with you, go to Hebrews 8, 8. It's the same verses. And, um, and if you have your Old Testament, go to Jeremiah 31, um, Isaiah, and then Jeremiah. Isaiah is really long, 66 chapters, so chances are you can find Isaiah. Then go to the right a little bit. Jeremiah is a little shorter, but it's right there next to him. Jeremiah 31, verse 31. It says this, The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers. When I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant. Though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord, this is the covenant I'll make with the house of of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I'll put my law in their minds. I'll write it on their hearts. 
I will be their God. They will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother saying, Know the Lord. They will know all. They will all know me. From the least to the greatest, declares the Lord. I will forgive their wickedness. I will remember their sin no more. It's repeated in Hebrews 8 about Jesus. That Jesus instituted a new covenant. You see, we cannot keep the Mosaic law. We know that. But the law is not bad. The law tells us what's good, what's right to do, but we just can't keep it up. So that covenant fell apart in, from our end. And then Jesus came. And in the new covenant, just like God just went through the animals and said, I will do this for you. Jesus said, I got this. I will take on your sin. I will pay the penalty for your sin. You, what you couldn't keep, I will fulfill perfectly. What you could not do, I will do perfectly. Jesus took our sin, and he gives us his righteousness. And he says, you stay there. I'm going to get up on the cross. I'm going to die for your sin. And all you need to do is believe in me and follow me and trust in me. And I will establish this covenant. I will make sure that it happens. I will bring it about. Romans 5, 6 says, For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. It's all part of God's plan. It's, it wasn't a reaction. It didn't take him by, by shock that, Oh no, Adam and Eve sinned. What am I going to do? Jesus, Son of God, of Holy Spirit, what should we do? The, the, the Godhead in, in a tizzy would have to know. This was God's foreordained plan before anything happened, before he created anything. He already knew, this is how I'm going to make the world. And it's going to cost me that my son, Jesus, was going to have to come, become a man, and live a perfect life, die on the cross, to redeem all the stuff that got messed up by sin. And one day, he's coming again. And he'll fully redeem this world. And then we'll see it like it was intended to be. Everything will be put right. But God established his covenant with Abram. He established his new covenant with us through Jesus. He began it. He ensured it. He will uphold it just as he did with Abram. So last week we looked at why we need to be saved. Our sin. We have sinned, all of us. How are we saved? That was two weeks ago. By grace, through faith. It's credited to us as righteousness. How are we sustained? That's this week. By God. He sustains us. He holds us up. I want you to rest in the fact that God began the work in you and he will see it through. Philippians 1.6 says this. Paul says, I'm, I'm so glad for you. I'm thankful for all you in Philippi. And he says, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it out, carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. That means until Jesus comes back, he's going to keep working in you. God will ensure that you fulfill the new co uh, covenant. Christ paid the price for you. Rest in that. Rest in that. Live it out. I don't want you coming to church, going to prayer time, sharing the gospel, serving in the nursery to earn the covenant that was given to you by grace. But I do want you to do all those things to honor the covenant, because God will guarantee it. I said this two weeks ago. Stop trying to earn what has already been paid for. Stop trying to get God's favor and to earn and be, be worthy of the salvation that you have, because you're never going to be worthy enough. You never will. But God is going to see through and he will continue to be faithful 
even when we're not. He will continue the work he began. He set the covenant, he ratified the covenant, and he upheld it and made sure it worked with Abram, and he will do the same thing with you. Church, members of the new covenant, rest in the fact that God who began this good work in you will see it through. When you get discouraged, when you even get depressed, when life seems to push in on you, rest in the fact that you are not the one holding up the covenant with, the, with God. He is. He's already paid that on the cross for you. Nothing you do can add to what Christ did. But now because of what Christ did, we can do everything to honor God in response to worship him in response of all the good that he has done for us.